Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to continue talking about cranial nerve 1, or the olfactory nerve, but we're now going to switch gears and talk about a different part of it, and that's Jacobson's organ, also called the vomerotonasal organ. Let's zoom in on the olfactory bulb over here. Recall that the olfactory nerve, or cranial nerve 1, is really just the olfactory bulb, and then the tracts, or olfactory tracts, that project posteriorly from that. And if we look here just below the olfactory bulb, we have this bone right here. This is the cribriform plate. And the cavity above that is the cranial cavity, and below it is the nasal cavity. Now, of course, the olfactory bulb sits on the cranial side of the cribriform plate. And then if we look from the olfactory bulb, there are these projections. They're actually cells and axons of these cells. And these cells are called the olfactory receptor cells. And they lie in a bed of cells called the olfactory epithelium. We covered this in the previous video. Now if we look here, this individual is smelling a rose. And the rose has little molecules, and these molecules are called odorants. Odorants are just molecules that can trigger olfaction, or a smell. And so they're airborne, and they travel through the air. They enter through the person's nostrils, and then into the nasal vestibule right here, and then into the respiratory region of the nasal cavity, and then up here to the olfactory region of the nasal cavity. And on these receptor cells, on this end in the nasal cavity, there are little proteins. They're actual receptors. And these odorants bind to those receptors, and when they do, that information regarding that molecule is transmitted up these cells into the olfactory bulb, through the olfactory tracts, and then to different parts of the brain that are involved in interpretation. And that's how most odorants are perceived. That's how most smell is perceived. Now, there's another component of the olfactory nerve that we're going to cover in this video, and that's the Jacobson's organ, or vomeronasal organ, is actually the more common term I've seen in the literature. You'll notice that Jacobson's organ actually lies all the way down here in the respiratory region of the nasal cavity. It's not up here by the olfactory epithelium. It's actually down here quite a ways. And what is it responsible for doing? Well, it still picks up odorants, but a different type of odorant. And those odorants are called pheromones. Pheromones are non-volatile chemicals, so just molecules basically, that are released by any organism normally through their apocrine glands. So just a brief review, when we talked about the integumentary system, we talked about different kinds of sweat glands. One of them was called the sudoriferous gland, and that's the normal sweat gland that we think of. So when you go outside on a hot day and you start sweating, or you get nervous and anxious and you start sweating, or in the gym and you're exercising, that salty sweat where you also get some of that, the waste products released, those are from sudoriferous glands. Now these sudoriferous glands are located all over the body with the exception of areas where there's thick skin. So that would include the bottom of the feet and also possibly the thinner eminence of the hands. Now the apocrine glands are fewer and far between. They're really only in select areas. For example, in humans, we tend to find them in the axilla, so in the armpit, and in the perineum region, so basically under the genitals. And these apocrine glands release a different kind of secretion, and contained in that secretion are molecules called pheromones. Here's an example of a pheromone down here. This is estrotetraenol. If you've ever seen the chemical structure of estradiol, which is the major female estrogen, you'll notice that this compound is actually very similar to it. In fact, it's derived from a similar metabolic pathway. But this is an example of a pheromone. And they're released by those apocrine glands in the secretion. And from the secretion, those pheromones can become airborne. So they move out of the secretion, they travel through the air, and then they potentially enter an organism's nasal cavity and they're able to bind two receptors in Jacobson's organ, and then they transmit that information through this nerve tract, also called the vomeronasal tract or Jacobson's tract, all the way here into the olfactory bulb. So even though Jacobson's organ exists separately from the olfactory epithelium right here for most odorants, uh, they still converge into the same structure, the olfactory bulb. Now let's take a look at that pathway to the brain in a little bit more detail. So right here is the olfactory bulb. This is our enlarged part of cranial nerve 1. 
And then going to the right here in the picture is really going posterior. This is the olfactory tract. We can see the axons that project to different parts of the brain. And we discussed that in a lot of detail in the previous video. Now when we talk about general olfaction, remember that those olfactory receptor cells cross the cribriform plate and they move up into the olfactory bulb here in these structures encircled here called glomeruli where they synapse with either mitral cells or tufted cells, although the vast majority are mitral cells. And you can see there that the mitral cells, their axons and project from the bulb into the tracts and they go to the various parts of the brain. Well, associated with the olfactory bulb, there's another part of it called the accessory olfactory bulb. This is the component that's associated with the vomeronasal organ. So I mentioned that there's vomeronasal or Jacobson's organ. It has this nerve tract that goes up here into the olfactory region, crosses the cribriform plate, and then enters the olfactory bulb, specifically at the accessory olfactory bulb. You can see that tract right here. And it synapses with another mitral cell, which you see here in red. And that mitral cell is going to continue on through the bulb and into the olfactory tract. Okay. Now, one thing just to be clear about here, if we look at the mitral cells and the tufted cells that ultimately are synapsing with the olfactory receptor cells, those axons become part of what's called the lateral olfactory tract. Okay, so the ones in blue here. You'll notice that the mitral cells coming from the accessory olfactory bulb are not part of that lateral olfactory tract, although they still exist in the entirety of the olfactory tract. Now if we follow the axons of these mitral cells coming from the accessory olfactory bulb, we follow them and they lead to the amygdala, which is part of the limbic system. And from the amygdala, that information travels to the hypothalamus. Now, remember the hypothalamus has a lot of functions. Uh, it's involved in sleep regulation, it's involved in hunger and thirst, stress response, autonomic regulation. Arguably though, the most important function of the hypothalamus here as it relates to pheromones and the vomeronasal organ would be the regulation of mating behavior or sexual behavior. For a moment, let's consider almost any other mammal besides humans. We could be talking about a rat, a cat, a goat, a cow. These organisms mate pretty much for the sole purpose of reproduction, which is different from humans. And in order to be able to reproduce, the male has to fertilize the female secondary oocyte, their egg, right? But remember that for these organisms, the females, they're only fertile for a small window of time each cycle. Some organisms have what we would call a menstrual cycle. Others have an equivalent called an estrous cycle. They're kind of the same thing. But there's a problem here. How does the male know when the female is fertile? Does the female say, hey, look at me over here, I'm fertile, come on, let's do this? No, of course not, right? In fact, these animals don't even talk with words. So the male has to have some other way of knowing when the female is fertile. In other words, when she's ovulating. And so around the time of ovulation, the amounts of these pheromones like estrotetraenol that the female makes goes way up. And so you can imagine that these pheromones are able to enter the male nostril. They bind to the receptors on the vomeronasal organ, go through this pathway, and so that's how the male knows exactly when the female's fertile. Because around the time of fertility, these pheromones increase a lot. And of course, that influences mating behavior. Now you're probably thinking, well, surely humans don't have a vomeronasal organ. I mean, we mate for other reasons other than reproduction. We don't need one of those, right? Well, it turns out we actually do have a vomeronasal organ. Uh, this little ellipsoid structure right here within the nasal cavity, the respiratory region that is, this is our vomeronasal organ or Jacobson's organ. Okay, so you're probably thinking, well, yeah, we have one, but it's probably non-functional. I mean, humans have uh, higher cognitive processes, critical thought, uh, we're more evolved creatures, this is probably vestigial, and that is not correct. This actually does have functions in humans, um, even though we certainly have more critical thought than, let's say, a rat, it still has some function and there are studies to prove it. The first one was actually a famous study referred to as the stripper study. It's not actually called the stripper study, but that's kind of its nickname. If you're not familiar with it, basically at a strip club, these women dance for men and the men just give as much money to them as they desire. Now what they did in the study is they took all the women from a given night and they looked at how much money each of them got. And then they grouped them. 
they said, okay, these women were ovulating. These women were not ovulating. Can you guess the result? The women who were ovulating had much more money earned that night than the women who were not ovulating. And this is something that's been reproduced, and we actually understand the mechanism to some extent. Basically, in the women who were ovulating, they were producing more of these pheromones, they then become airborne, and they bind to the vomeronasal organ of these males who were in the club at the same time. And through this pathway, by convergence at the hypothalamus, they're able to subconsciously influence male behavior. Now, for humans, this is certainly subconscious. I don't think there's a single human out there who is consciously aware of these pheromones, but for many other organisms like cats and dogs, they do have some conscious awareness of it. You've probably seen a cat or a dog sniff another's butt. They're not actually sniffing the anus. What they're actually doing is sniffing the apocrine glands that are in that area, which release pheromones, and they can tell a lot of information about their fellow cats and dogs by doing so. All right. So now let's take a look in more detail at how these pheromones actually influence stereotypical mating behavior. So here's two cats, and I don't need to tell you that this is typical mating behavior. We've got the male up here, the female down here. Let's take a look. Now both of these cats are making their respective pheromones. From the apocrine glands of the male cat, you can see that he's manufacturing androstadienol. This is basically the male homolog of the estrotetraenol that I showed you a couple slides ago. So this is the male pheromone, and just like the female pheromone, it goes airborne. And it's able to travel through the female's nostrils and stimulate her vomeronasal organ. And then through that pathway that we just talked about, that information is carried to the amygdala, and then the hypothalamus, and therefore the female is going to be able to sense that the male is fertile. If we think about a very, very young cat before they are fertile, the amounts of these types of pheromones that they make are very, very low. And so the female would probably be able to sense that that male is not yet fertile. But as the male matures and becomes fertile, the amounts of this pheromone are going to skyrocket. And so as this increases more and more, the male is more and more fertile. And so if these levels of androstadienol are very high, that's going to indicate to the female that the male is fertile. And so the female will then display stereotypical mating behavior, which in most quadrupeds involves lordosis, more specifically lumbar lordosis. To understand lordosis, imagine getting in a quadruped position and take your lumbar erector spiny muscles and contract them. When you do that, you'll experience anterior pelvic tilt. And in a quadruped position like this, it'll actually angle your rear upwards. And it basically makes the female genitalia more accessible to the male. And that's stereotypical female mating behavior, lordosis. But of course, this works reciprocally as we've already kind of insinuated. The female is also releasing a pheromone, and that would be estrotetraenol. Again, in the same way as the male pheromone, it goes airborne and enters the male nostril to stimulate the male vomeronasal organ. That information is then relayed to the amygdala and then to the hypothalamus, and then the male is going to be able to sense that the female is ovulating. And assuming that this cat is wanting to mate for the purpose of reproduction, this is telling the male that the female is ovulating and therefore there is a window of time that she is fertile. And so obviously then the male will display stereotypical male mating behavior. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of Jacobson's organ, also called the vomeronasal organ, and how the pheromones are able to relay subconscious, or in some cases conscious information, ultimately to the hypothalamus to influence mating behavior. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.